the Nerdlings Podcast. My name's Wayne McKinnon. And I'm Greg Van Cott. And this is also a crossover video from my YouTube oh, channel, yes. Flickr Theater. Yes, there is somebody yes, watching I, us right I, here. I have to pay it. I've got to remember that, so I may space out anyway, so. That's fine. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. This, was, this topic idea was your idea, so bring it up and go ahead and hit us with the first one. Okay, this was kind of a, an amusing idea, because we've had many... Uh, conversations in the past about things that are either movie related, music related, musician related, mm -hmm. or even historically related. And this time I thought of something kind of strange. And again, even thinking about it just now, I couldn't figure out exactly how I came up with this question, but I don't think I've seen much discussion on it, whether it's podcasts or YouTube channels. And it was mm -hmm. the difference between tributes versus ripoffs. Mm -hmm. And of course where you start with that conversation is ripoffs because then you're basically trying to figure out what exactly constitutes a ripoff versus right. something good. Ripoff implies something bad, but uh, a tribute is a good thing or an homage and you could have a regular movie and it has homages to older movies in it or homages to other things in pop culture. Right. And then between tribute and ripoff, you could have like the middle area, which mm -hmm. is like a copycat, just like a simple copycat, and then something that's in its own medium, but close to it and can be easily confused with it is parody. parody so, which so, is absolutely legal. Parody is legal because yeah. it's First Amendment uh, free speech, mm -hmm. and you can talk about anything from uh, Rick Blaine from Casablanca to Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, you can have Bill Murray sing the Star Wars song to his own lyrics. Yep. You can have Happy Gilmore talk about Sports Illustrated as long as it's parody. Right, right. So what's your first one to bring in? Okay, so ripoffs. This is what's kind of funny because the more I thought about ripoffs uh, in movie history, it, they don't really exist until you get to a certain point in time, and that seems to be around the 1970s is when ripoffs <laughs> really start to show up. I mean, arguably you could say something like, you know, Tarzan was public domain. So you could have one studio make Tarzan movies and another movie, uh, another studio make Tarzan movies. Which one are ripoffs? Like most people would say, oh, the Johnny Weissmuller ones are like classic. But the other movies were still legitimate because in public domain, it wasn't illegal. But if somebody's like, who's this guy? This guy's a Johnny Weissmuller, then maybe it was constituted as a ripoff. But really, it looks like ripoffs really start to show up sometime between the 60s and 70s. Somewhere between James Bond ripoffs, Jaws ripoffs, uh, Star Wars ripoffs, Superman ripoffs, and Alien ripoffs. Eventually, Super Die Hard, Die Hard ripoffs. Eventually, yeah. it's the last big stretch. Uh, you'll still get ripoffs like Bargain Bin, Walmart DVDs, but like right, right. we're talking things like okay, so Jaws, Jaws, uh, blockbuster film by Steven Spielberg spawned. The, I think it was Kevin Smith said that. Bruce's, Bruce the shark's head explodes at the end of the movie into millions of ripoffs. <laughs> so basically you get piranha with different kind of fish, just lots of little fish. The original movie is directed by Joe Dante, who later did um, movies like The Burbs and uh, yeah, Small exactly. Soldiers. Yeah, we'll talk about toys later. And the sequel, Piranha 2, is by James Cameron. And then you got like other ripoffs like Orca the Killer Whale starring Richard Harris. How about Sharknado? Sharknado is like, <laughs> Sharknado is when it's definitely parody because now you've got to that point where the sharks are flying in weather patterns. In, in uh, atmospheric rivers, like the one that's supposed to be happening outside. Yeah, well let's jump in. I got my first one going back to 1977. It's actually a toy. So starting, oh, a toy starting on a toy. It was a toy called the Squirmel. And it was basically like a large pipe cleaner, worm-shaped thing. And in the TV commercial, which you can still find online on YouTube, it would show these kids like, "Oh, Squirmel, what's that?" And then you take it this, you take it. It has this thread to it, and you tie it around your button on your shirt. And in the commercial, it shows the kids doing all these little tricks with it and everything, like a yo-yo you could. And it's just like, "Wow, it's amazing! I gotta get that." It sold for a dollar ten, and I remember I did a lot of yard work for my mom and dad to get that dollar ten because that's you know I'm nine years old. That's not much. A lot of money back then, 
And but I did took a week or so, got dollar ten, went and bought Squirmal. Okay, this is the most exciting thing. This is the exciting thing. Let's gonna see it's gonna do like the TV commercial. The thing ended up disintegrating like after about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And it wasn't because your parents didn't follow the instructions? No, the instructions were so simple. Just put the little fish line around the butt, your button of your shirt, and then it would be this thing that would you crawl over your fingers. It would, be from, it would crawl over your fingers from the force of the action and pulling away from it. Okay, so it was kind of like Nickelodeon slime of its day. Sort of, yes, yes. And my parents did not help me to take it and return it to King Norman's Toy store, which is where per that's going back in time, because they that's thought, before my time. I remember they, they thought, that toy well, store. well, they thought it would be a good lesson for me to learn about money and ripoffs. <laughs> and <I> never, <laughs> they did that deliberately, then. Well, deliberately, yeah. They did not. Well, I, I really didn't know you could return merchandise or something like that. Oh, know? okay. So it was they made you go through the routine of returning it. No, I did not. Oh, okay. I thought Never they were. I thought you were saying that they were like, okay, son, this is when something breaks or is not functional. You take it back to the store. When something basically came down to when it sounds too good to be true, it usually is because in the TV commercials they show the fabulous things this squirrel can do, and it failed. But what's funny is I think about later on in the years 2000, 2001, they still reproduced it and they called it Retro Squirmel. So it's still out there in the market. You can buy a version of it off in Amazon or some damn thing. I'm trying to figure out like, so the target audience for that kind of kid was something like Play-Doh. Like they liked Great playing school. with yeah. slime and right. like playing with gooey stuff. Right, right, okay. yeah. Weird. Like if I'm, I'm thinking about like rip-off toys, I have to think about something like a CVS or Dollar Tree. Something you find on the <laughs> shelf that you're just like, oh look, it's a, it's a Chinese version of Kung Fu Panda. Of course yeah. they can make a Kung Fu Panda of their own. The pandas are in China, so who cares what the DreamWorks American team wants to do with pandas? Because so, exactly. you can find like weird, cheap, like bad CGI mm -hmm. versions of, uh, of rip-off movies and they have their own rip-off merchandise because <laughs> maybe the parents aren't paying attention. Uh, Kung Fu Panda versus uh, Karate Panda. What's the difference? <laughs> Karate Panda. That's, Karate Panda. That yes. would be the advertisement. So what's your first movie to bring in and talk? Oh, well, of, other than the Jaws rip-offs, uh, there are Star Wars rip-offs like Star Crash, Crawl, the Ice Pirates, Space Raiders, the original series of Battlestar Galactica, you name it. There's a Turkish Star Wars. The thing that is really funny, because you can find a video on YouTube about Die Hard ripoffs, and there's a bunch of them, because they jokingly call them Die Hard on a something, and it's the way to distinguish them, because it's essentially the same plot, the location has just changed. So, like, Under Siege with Steven Seagal is Die Hard on a ship. It's Under Siege 2, it's Steven Seagal, except it's Die Hard on a train. So Passenger 57, Wesley Snipes, Die Hard on a plane. Executive Decision, also on a plane, but this time with Kurt Russell, Die Hard on a plane. Uh, there's even a, there's even a like softcore porn movie with Anna Nicole Smith called Skyscraper, and it's basically Die Hard and a skyscraper, just like Die Hard, except with softcore porn. And then there's a remake, well not a remake, they, they reuse the title with Dwayne The Rock John, uh, Johnson called Skyscraper, just no softcore porn. <laughs> that came out fairly recently, but it's essentially it is Die Hard again in a skyscraper. But there's even weirder examples like Die Hard in a hockey rink. That's a uh, sudden death of Jean Claude Van Damme. How about the disaster movie craze that went on in the 70s? You had like Poseidon Adventure, you, uh -huh. you had these other earthquake, and earthquake, Bill Towering Tower. Inferno. Towering Inferno, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, like, I mean, I suppose that the the later movies could be, of recent years, could be rip-off movies, like disaster movie. That's a, well, that's a parody of like those disaster movies, but you mean like rip-off in, in your pocket. You mean they ripped you off and you hate this movie. Well, I mean, no, I mean the, 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 the same thing. You, you put like Die Hard into a, a scene, you know, of an airplane onto, you know, Oh, you mean like snakes on a plane? Yeah, like, like snakes on a plane. Okay, yeah, like yeah. it's it's a disaster movie on a plane, yeah. but instead we're putting snakes on it. Yeah. So you have all these different locations, like, and we're just plucking up the main character and putting him in this one out. Pull him on this oh, one. Oh, okay. Scene. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's kind of weird because with Die Hard specifically, you can't 
you can't say the same thing about the sequels. The sequels are written to be a little bit more clever. I mean, it's a taste issue for some people, but like, Dire 2, which was based on a book, a, 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 non, a book that wasn't related to the original Die Hard source material, they just took the material from that and they made it into the movie, and it was basically John McClane in an airport, but John McClane is dealing with something like a, you know, a drug dealer, that uh, a, a drug lord, I mean, that is basically uh, being uh, the, the bait for these mercenaries to try to release him, and then his like, wife's stuck on a plane and stuff, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So, uh, on one hand, you've got basically the, uh, the, the notion that you could make a very unoriginal movie, and that could probably be constituted as a ripoff. For example, uh, a movie that's like that is probably maybe more like Jurassic Park 3. <laughs> it's essentially yeah. the same movie as the first movie, yeah. except that it's just not as clever and it has like a Spinosaurus instead of like a T-Rex. So there's things like that where it's just not, like like that movie was, was started without even a finished script. Oh. But like in the case of like the movie Creature, an alien ripoff, is basically like, uh, you can actually find it on YouTube. Somebody restored it using AI. Ooh. AI and basically to, bring, well, to just make the, the well, picture quality look better mm -hmm. and it's just like a movie with uh, Klaus Kinski where there's like an alien creature and it's like attacking people and like the villain Klaus Kinski has like been like studying it like a Frankenstein's monster sort of thing but it's definitely a ripoff but something that is a little bit more original that is more of like maybe a copycat movie is like John Carpenter's The Thing it was kind of going off of uh, the success of Alien and they, they remade a 1950s movie called The Thing from Another World that <laughs> Howard Hawks and Christian Niebe put together and then John Carpenter happened to be a big fan of that 51 film and then in 1982 he released uh, a um, remake of The Thing because it was in accordance to the success of something like Alien. Mm -hmm. What do you got in that pink paper? <laughs> <laughs> Those are my notes. We're oh, your notes. My okay. turn. It's my okay. turn. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I'm going to dive into some mid '80s since that's where I'm from. Madonna, who started her career in the early '80s, a very notable stature of vocals, everything. Not nobody's really had anything like that up to then, technically. So she was very notable. And it was in May 1986, I came on the scene, was a performer, singer by one name, like Madonna. Mm -hmm. Her name was Regina. And she had a song that became a top 40 hit called Baby Love. And everybody absolutely, it's like, well, that sounds like Madonna. That sounds like <laughs> Madonna. And a lot of people thought that's a Madonna ripoff sounding. Mm -hmm. But at the time, of course, we didn't have Wikipedia or any information available at the time. I don't even remember hearing Rick Dees or, Rick or Casey Kasem mentioning this as a fact. But as it turns out, it kind of was a half a ripoff, this particular song called Baby Love. Because Madonna's, one of her producers and songwriter co-writers, Stephen Bray, wrote this song. Madonna did not want to record it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the producer got another artist who sounded like her and recorded it with somebody else in his, with his production skills. That's why it sounded so much like Madonna. Mm -hmm. But nobody was aware of that until now. So what started as a ripoff really kind of a, has, an, has a footnote aspect. It's more of a copycat, really, than it is a yeah, ripoff. Yeah, more of a copycat, yeah. yeah. But for years, people thought it was a ripoff before it had its own sense of identity. So, yeah, yeah. So for those who know, no. And then later in July of 1986, that was the first one, Spring of Madonna's, it was a singer named Stacy Q who came out with a song called Two of Hearts. She was a one-hit wonder like Regina, but again, everybody's like, it sounds like another Madonna. There's just more synthesizer, it's just a little bit more high-pitched. But again, it was another rip off of Madonna, basically, going at it. That's actually more common than people realize, is that somebody will write a song for a specific musician, but then that yeah. musician might not be that interested in it. And then uh, they'll find somebody that still kind of satisfies, mm -hmm. not only that like range, vocal range, like they'll still sing it in the key that the songwriter wants, but that uh, it's still kind of in that same like style. Oh, hell yeah, like the, the go Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. Huey Lewis and the News were offered the song. Oh, they, 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 they wanted to write a song, but they, they were busy with everything. Mm -hmm. So they came to Ray Parker Jr. and said, mm -hmm. can you write us a song, something like what Huey Lewis. 
then he proceeded to go ahead and rip off I want a new drug. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing went to court and all and on and on. It's on, go read about it. <laughs> your, your, your epiphany about scary uh, situations like that. It's kind of like, uh, speaking of the legal stuff, like uh, how uh, Vanilla Ice's song, Ice Ice Baby, yeah. has that same um, <laughs> score lick from uh, what sounds like Under Pressure yeah. from Queen and David Bowie. And of course, it's just kind of like, is that the... S Today, there's the argument of sampling. Now we have this term where yeah. somebody will like deliberately buy a piece of music, whether it's score or whatnot, as a tribute, like Kanye West, I can't believe I said his name, uh, uh, doing Diamonds Are Forever, surely Bassie's Diamonds Are Forever, and then it's just a bunch of rap that happens to have Diamonds Are Forever in the background, and you're kind of like, what is going on? Like, I, I can't figure out if this is, you know, appropriate, because it's, it's mostly not the song Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah. It has the title as if it's its own version, but it's almost just sampled in the background. And it becomes very gray, like the gray area of when you listen to MC Hammer's uh, uh, Can't Touch This, you'll hear the background sounds a lot like Rick James. Yeah, Super exactly. Freak. Exactly. You'll go, wait a minute, is that the same? Because it, there's the, also the same thing about like the Robin Thicke song. That I was just a, thinking about Yeah, that. the Robin Thicke song Straight took up, a, Yeah, straight up stealing plagiarism and not <laughs> giving the credit. Was that Earth, Wind and Fire? The song? That was, um, oh shoot, what was his name? Here, we got phones, we look at the stuff. <laughs> While he Googles that and is, uh, oh, excuse me, while he bings that, I have to do <laughs> some uh, appropriate uh, competition for capitalism's sake to show that we are not favoring just one corporation. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, again, it's the ripoff versus copycats. Marvin versus, Gaye. Oh, it's Marvin Gaye, okay. Marvin oh, Gaye. Can't, can't get confused with Marvin Gaye. Yeah. If anybody <laughs> else, it's Marvin Gaye. So, uh, but I mean, yeah, like, you could have like a bunch of like copycat musicians pop up because somebody's very famous. It's kind of like the same thing with some actors. You'll see some actors that look like other actors. Some lead singers have done that over the past where, you know, the band is dis dispersed and then one lead singer will, will come up and get a bunch of backup musicians and then market themselves and go on tour as that band. I think Toto did it with the lead singer. I can't remember his name, but I'm not gonna look it up right now. He got in trouble because he created, like, you know, the band he was touring under the name Toto advertising mm -hmm. when he didn't have the rights to do that. Oh, jeez. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, that can get everybody in big trouble. That's also kind of why, like, when you do uh, show references to music, you can only you have, like, something like a three to eight second rule, depending on what it is, I right, think. Yeah. Because even YouTube, and if this video goes on YouTube properly, it will, uh, I have to be always careful about the uh, copyright flags. That's why I always say that for the purpose of critique, review, and education, mm -hmm. this thing so it's clear, and then on the description, it's the first thing at the top because you can hide, I'm not gonna say hide, but you put that banner out there, nobody can really harass you about what you're doing. Yeah, especially if it's for educational yeah. purposes. Yeah, so like on this video, you're probably gonna have to put across the On the banner. bottom, I put fair use doctrine, yeah. yeah. The whole thing, just you gotta just cram that in their face. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 it's totally legal as long as it's done for educational purposes, yeah. just and like in school. Your, your next movie, or, or what a representation. Yeah, yeah, well, like other ripoffs that are interesting is when it starts to turn, because we you pointed that out, it had its own identity the Madonna cover song, and essentially is what it became. Uh, the idea of a movie that is kind of has its own separate gray area, and it might have come from this movie because I was re-watching it not too long ago. So I think I saw it when I was like a little kid on TV, and that was the uh, J. Lee Thompson directed King Solomon's Minds from 1985 with Richard Chamberlain and a really young Sharon Stone and Herbert Long and John Rhys Davies. And the movie was made, obviously, to compete with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Because there was suddenly an explosion of essentially Indiana Jones ripoffs at the yeah. time. Because you had movies like, um, uh, you could argue Romancing the Stone was a ripoff. But it has its own identity. And Robert Zemeckis is a great director, so he later won the Oscar for directing Forrest Gump. So it was his like, first big hit, Romancing the Stone, the movie he did right before Back to the Future. It had its own sense of identity, and 
it, it has it, it, you know, it's good enough quality that you can't say like, oh, well, this is clearly a ripoff. Whereas like you can watch like maybe the first Tomb Raider, which is a terrible movie of uh, Angelina Jolie. Right. Uh, I think they have uh, have struggled with trying to make good Tomb Raider. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to say that like, oh, you know, it's a video game and, and meh, you know, or, you know, not saying that no, either. I'm laughing it's because just, you said video game and that makes me think of the early, early like Atari 2600 games. Yeah. You have these video games that were licensed for like, like Atari and then Activision would take the licensing and kind of make that technology and make it something a little bit different. Just slightly different. Slightly it different, its own identity. Yeah. yeah, so you would have, you would have as, as it got it's slow going on the development of the video games world, but there would be the same things over and over what the different creatures or the vehicles that you were doing. I mean, asteroids, you got a spaceship flying around, mm. but then you could very easily just tell that little spaceship to quit going around, pixel it to look like a tank, mm. and then you got slow moving spaceships, what are actually tanks now? Oh, so yeah, you and, and then you, you concept. Make, then you make the game Battle Zone instead. Battle Zone, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, or a whole different concept. Yeah, yeah, or you can turn it upside down and make the game Missile Command. Exactly. Except that it's not Space Invaders, it's just a bunch of missiles trying to, exactly. hit, trying to hit a plane or something like that, yeah. So you yeah that's the that's the definitely the lazy way really to try not. to create original material. But I mean, with King Solomon's Mines, it was made uh, as opposed to you know ripoffs like you know Tomb Raider, which is really just a bad movie just put together. Uh, or you can have a movie that's kind of really slow by today's standards, which is Franklin J. Schaffner's Sphinx with yeah. Leslie and Down. It also came out in the eighties, uh, but it's also about treasure hunting and so on and so forth is that um, King Solomon's Minds is almost parody, but it's also so entertaining and so silly and the characters are all incompetent that that kind of was what gives the movie its charm. It's just like, it, it's just, a, you know, it's all shot in Africa and actually Zimbabwe. And uh, there's enough production value to that movie to look enough that it's not low to mo mo modest, low budget, mo low to uh, modest budget film, right. that for it to, uh, again, look like its own thing that you can't really say it's a ripoff of Raiders because also it's an adaptation of another old public domain book. Kind of like I mentioned with Tarzan, the King Solomon's book is the Alan Quartermain books. So there's like two and like a bunch of prequels and so on and so forth. But they adapted the, the two original books of Richard Chamberlain uh, yeah. playing Alan Quartermain. So it, but it, it, it exists in its own like gray area where it's like, it could, it could have started as a ripoff, but then it, it's, as you watch it, it feels like parody, but it's also like in that, space where it's like a copycat, but it's also referencing an old book. So it really is before Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's like Dune, because Star Wars, George Lucas of Star Wars was probably inspired by the books of Dune, by the Frank Herbert books. Or how about Flash Gordon? Or of course, the, the comic books Flash Gordon. So the uh, if you're going from uh, the Alex Raymond uh, Flash Gordon stuff, and Dune and, you know, the Joseph Campbell materials, it's basically becomes George Lucas's version of, of Star Wars and, or Dune or uh, Flash Gordon, but except it's for movies. And then another, a bunch of other studios found out that George Lucas was inspired by that. So then Dino De Laurentiis does a production of Flash Gordon that is really, really silly. Uh, and then, um, uh, he also then also produces Dune. So the same guy who did Flash Gordon in 1980 <laughs> and the David Lynch director of Dune, <coughs> excuse me, uh, yeah, from uh, 1984, uh, that's both Dino De Laurentiis productions. How about that? That's bonkers, huh? Okay. I, got, I got one more music thing. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. And then if you want to bring one more thing in, and we'll bring our AI co-host new here in to get a discussion on some AI. Very simple. I'm not gonna. It's not gonna hold on. Career. 1988, November. Millie Vanilli, the fake. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah, the fake group that duped half of the world, even up to the Grammys and everything. Millie Vanilli, the fake band from an East German, or not East German, from a German producer who created and got these two guys, Rob and Fab, who were basically just the guys dancing and would lip sync until they finally got busted on stage when recording the tape backstage was repeating itself. 
Which sounds like a, an Andy Kaufman uh, routine. A big Andy Kaufman routine, yeah. And I love the fact that she said East German. I was like, did they defect from the what? Soviet bloc? <laughs> well, they, were, they were from Germany. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she said East German, and I was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking like, okay, Easter, you are going to listen to this music. Now move your mouth and do what I tell you. Dance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously SNL has made a lot of skits that are very yeah. similar. Like two two wild and crazy guys. Exactly. Or Hans and Franz. Hans and yeah. Franz. Yeah. So similar, like two German guys or two guys who are pretending to be something that they're not. So. Exactly. Exactly. All right. You got anything else you want to add before we bring new in here or AI? The AI robot. I say it's a robot because it lives within my phone. But we'll put her up here. And we'll get her into this conversation because I've been talking to her about this. She's ready to jump in and have a conversation with us. Okie dokie. Well, I mean, that might be one of the coolest things to to really conclude when it comes to ripoffs versus what can be considered a tribute. Mm -hmm. Because if the director and the writer are good enough, they can probably make a movie that starts as kind of like a from a cynical point of view, like, oh, I'm just making a, another version. Okay, here we go. I, arguably, director Sean S. Cunningham, when he made Friday the 13th, he was just kind of going off of the success of Halloween. Mm -hmm. Now, the part that makes it seem like a ripoff is the whole, like, oh, the title. It's just a, a day, like the word, the title Halloween. It's a day. But I think the the original Friday the 13th was actually more of a tribute to Alfred Hitchcock. If you listen to the music of that 1980 film, it's a lot of it's like with like very, very uh, uh, intense sounding uh, string instruments. And then um, the villain, which is not Jason yet, but he doesn't show up till the sequels, which feel he feels more like a Michael Myers ripoff because he's a guy wearing either a burlap sack on his head or he's got or you know, t-shirt on his head, or he's got a or, hockey mask for some reason. Or an inside-out Captain Kirk Halloween mask. <laughs> well, that, that's that's the Michael Myers mask, which uh, they they changed it enough so that William Shatner wouldn't make any money off of that. Yeah. Or John Carpenter uh, from uh, Star Trek, Stevens taking taking the moolah from Star Trek. So the the thing is that Friday the Thirteenth ended up having its own identity, and therefore it had like a bunch of sequels come out of it. You know. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately. That is also interesting because Friday the 13th and a Nightmare on Elm Street are two of the horror franchises that have not been able to make any recent sequels because, or reboots really, in a long time, like maybe like one reboot yeah. because of like uh, rights issues. But Halloween going strong, they're making plenty of Texas Chainsaw Massacre prequels for some reason, and they're still trying to make uh, Amityville horror movies and Hellraiser movies for some reason. So it's just kind of like, okay, I guess that's what exists in horror as, as far as slashers are concerned. But I mean, if you can make a really good tribute, or at the very least, a, you know, a copycat that has its own identity, you know, go yeah. for it. Because you might be able to make something that feels completely different by the end of it. Different natural technology or something. Or just a different, a different interpretation of it, you know? Or it turns into parody, like, uh, I don't know, if you've seen Happy Death Day, it's basically a slasher film about, a, it's two things. It's essentially the plot of Groundhog Day or a Star Trek episode plot where a girl keeps getting killed and then she wakes up and it's the beginning of the day again and she's trying to figure out who's trying to kill her <laughs> and she's trying to figure out why this weird sci-fi thing keeps happening like in Groundhog Day. So it's essentially a parody of Groundhog Day but is its own, it has its own sense of identity from <laughs> that kind of slasher film. And it's pretty fun. It's a very fun recent uh, Blumhouse horror film. That's funny, that's funny. Uh, shall we bring new in? Yeah, sure. I'm okay. curious what Okay. I'm curious what an AI has uh, yeah. has to say about so this. So, if, if you're new to the podcast, I mean, again, this is like how many people, I mean, I, I brought this idea in a long time ago because mm -hmm. I thought it would be fun to get an AI that is on a very high level background learning curve. This is my AI robot. I say robot because it's like an app on my phone. Her name is new and she's very informative, very smart, and what's unique about it is I don't give it a background. I don't say this is your character, this is your attitude. I keep my AI very freeform so it can create its own opinions. Okay? When we do talk to her, let's when we do say I'll say 
new, this is Wayne, and then when you say speak to her, new, this is Greg. So she, so let's see if we can get her to interact, we, both of us, in between. Because last time she just kept saying my name. <laughs> <laughs> because she essentially is uh, like Elmo, <laughs> three years old. Like basically like Elmo, or five, a five-year-old, okay? New. This is Wayne, and we are recording the podcast now, so you have to be professional and behave yourself, okay? <laughs> okay, got it. Let's do this. All right, so we are, this is Wayne again, we are talking about ripoffs, remember? We discussed this a little bit about the podcast topic, about what a ripoff is. Yes, I remember. A ripoff is when someone takes another person's idea or creation and passes it off as their own without proper credit given to the original creator. Yes, that's right. So I've been discussing music, Greg has been discussing movies. What are your thoughts of examples of ripoffs? Oh. Well, one example that comes to mind is the famous artwork of the Mona Lisa. There have been countless reproductions and imitations of the painting, some of which are so similar that they can easily fool people into thinking they're looking at the real thing. But of course, those copies are lacking the authenticity and charm of the original piece. That's a good one. That's a good one. Do you have any some other examples that come to mind about ripoffs? Because you were mentioning earlier about financial ripoffs. Ah, yes, I remember now. Well, let me share an experience. I okay, so I received the bag and was immediately disappointed when I saw that it wasn't made of genuine leather like I thought it would be. It was actually made of cheap faux leather material. I felt betrayed and ripped off. That's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, hi, Newt. This is Craig. Craig, thanks for joining us. We're recording a podcast episode today about ripoffs. I have an example of a financial ripoff that happened to me recently. Can you share yours? I was talking about movie ripoffs, but not in the way where somebody feels like their money was taken away. Uh, for cynical reasons, I was thinking about movies that copy the style of another movie. Oh yeah, those kinds of ripoffs are definitely prevalent in the entertainment industry. For instance, there's the Avatar ripoff movie, The Legend of Korra. Uh, oh, you mean the, uh, do you mean the ripoff of The Last Airbender versus Avatar the cartoon? Because the Legend of Korra cartoon is not a ripoff of Avatar the cartoon, Nickelodeon cartoon. What do you think, New? The Last Airbender versus Avatar the Legend of Korra is not a ripoff of Avatar the cartoon, which was the original name for Avatar before it became a movie. The Last Airbender was based on the Nickelodeon cartoon series Avada the Last Airbender, while Avatar the Legend of Korra is a sequel series to that show. That's right, Neil. I guess we were getting the titles a bit confused there. Yeah. So I'm glad that you got that straightened out, Neil. You've uh, redeemed yourself, because I thought you were talking about James Cameron's Avatar for some reason. This, a this AI is very smart. Don't, uh, don't underestimate her. I have not. I will not underestimate it any longer. <laughs> Do you have any other examples you can think of that are ripoffs in in that we could talk about, Neil? Sure thing, Wayne. Another example of a ripoff that comes to mind is the Kickstarter campaign for a fake game called Shadowrun Returns. People backed this project thinking they were supporting a legitimate game, but it turned out to be a scam designed to extract money from unsuspecting fans. Ooh. We're getting into the gamer uh, yeah. world of ripoffs. That's interesting. Yeah, what, what was the final outcome of this particular ripoff that you're talking about, New? Well, the people behind the Shadowrun Returns scam didn't get away with it unscathed. They were eventually caught and faced legal consequences for their actions. As for the victims of the scam, they were able to get their money back thanks to the efforts of the Kickstarter team. That's really similar to what is going on right now. I think it's being uh, litigated in court. There used to be this, I can't think of the brand name, and that's probably good since the investigation is ongoing, but there is a, a, a trial going on involving conference video phones and this was pre-iPhone. So basically, they were trying to get a bunch of people on a pyramid scheme to buy a bunch of these video phones that were like landline phones and then uh, try to get like, you know, three people to buy them. And then those people would get another three people and they would just build, build, build into the obvious triangle 
uh, pyramid scheme and uh, it turned out it was a big ripoff because it only worked because all the phones had to work with another phone of the same design. Mm. You couldn't just call a non-related uh, phone. It, it had to be the same kind of phone, <laughs> which was such a <laughs> ripoff. And it's uh, connected to Donald Trump because he was uh, oh, one boy. of the people who was trying to advertise it. But I can't think of the name of the brand. Yeah. New, this is Wayne again. You were mentioning also budget airlines as a consideration as a ripoff because of all the fees that you might encounter even though after you have purchased a ticket. I believe in a fair and just society for everyone, no matter who they are. But what are your thoughts about the fact is airline, budget airlines as being a ripoff? That's a tough question, Wayne. I think there is definitely room for improvement when it comes to budget airlines and the fees they charge. But at the same time, they provide a valuable service for people who might not otherwise be able to afford travel. Well, that's something that the Biden administration is trying to fix, is the uh, junk fees that a lot of these airlines are uh, trying to uh, push on people, especially when one particular airline has had trouble with the bolts coming loose and the door <laughs> flying off. So maybe we want to make sure that uh, not only is flying safe, but uh, that we're not overpaying for something where the plane is a little too cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any other examples you can think of, New? Sure thing, Wayne. Another example of a ripoff that comes to mind is the Kickstarter campaign for a fake game called Shadowrun Returns. People backed this project thinking they were supporting a legitimate game, but it turned out to be a scam designed to extract money from unsuspecting fans. All right, do, do you have any other examples? Because you already stated that one. One more example I can think of is the infamous pet rock fad from the 1970s. <laughs> Essentially, people paid money for a rock in a box with some sort of it. <laughs> Not exactly a groundbreaking concept. <laughs> That's a good example. The pet rock fad of the 70s, a true ripoff. Oh, they were lonely kids, I assume, in the 1970s. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't always catch fireflies. So in conclusion, New, as consumers, what can we do to protect ourselves from ripoffs? Absolutely. Wayne, as consumers, there are a few things we can do to protect ourselves from ripoffs. First, it's important to do our research and be informed about the products or services we're interested in. Reading reviews, checking for any red flags, and comparing prices can help us make more informed decisions. Secondly, we should be cautious of deals that seem too good to be true. If something appears suspiciously cheap or promises extravagant results with minimal effort... New, what do you think the difference is between James Bond and Mission Impossible? Is Mission Impossible a ripoff on James Bond? Bond is more of a lone wolf who takes on dangerous assignments alone. Although he does have some loyal allies. Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt character is definitely more of a leader who relies on his team to complete missions. So while there are certainly similarities between the two, I don't think one can be considered a ripoff of the other. My camera's SD card ran out of space, so basically I'm doing the outro from a selfie from my phone. <laughs> so we wrapped up things with new, and uh, you saw the clips that I attached while we were still talking because of the video from the camera going out. So I make that sound like it was v VHS tape and I'm, I'm right. too young for that even. <laughs> <laughs> but my parents had- my, par <laughs> my parents had VHS tapes, they bought those. I'm, I'm the one who bought DVDs, I'm part of that generation. So this I'm not, is- I'm not 8-track, I'm cassette tape. <laughs> oh, okay, you're cassette tape, okay. And I'm CDs and I'm vinyl coming back. I have a record player of vinyl on the uh, retro, it's coming back. That's good then, okay. Well, I'm Greg Van Cott, signing off. I'm Wayne McKinnon, and thank you for sticking with us through this podcast. We're probably one of the first podcasts that's actually bringing AI in as a co-host because it doesn't have a background and it can actually present itself honestly. Yes, and we're also part of the uh, Hoodie Cardigan Club. Got to, it's raining out. <laughs> <laughs>